major uh, in economics, psychology, and business from Rice University and a master's of business administration from Cornell University. Lieutenant Commander Jim Reidenstock is currently a pilot in the U.S. Navy Reserve where he flies the E-2C Hawkeye in Central and South America in support of American War on Drugs. John Olson is married with six children. John earned a Master's of Arts degree in Industrial and Organizational Psychology and Law degree from the University of Tulsa. And in 2010, John started his own human resource consulting business. He is currently still serving our country with distinction in the 1st Battalion 354 Regiment. Let me introduce our speakers, John Jim Bridenstock and John Olson.
an interesting question. Uh, he keeps saying this 30% federal sales tax. I am for a uh, tax policy many people are familiar with called the fair tax. This is not an unusual thing. This is a, this is a, a plan that is sponsored on the Democratic side from the state of Oklahoma by Dan Moore. It's also sponsored on the Republican side by John Sullivan, James Lankford, Frank Lucas, and in the Senate by Senator Inhofe and Senator Coburn. Uh, what the fair tax is, it, is it eliminates uh, it, all taxes. It eliminates taxes on income, corporate taxes, capital gains taxes, taxes on interest, taxes on dividends, uh, payroll taxes. It eliminates all these taxes, and it replaces all these taxes with a single tax on consumption at the point of sale. And so what happens under this plan, prices, everything we buy has built into it prices that include taxes. Um, so all these taxes that I just mentioned, whenever you buy something, we're paying all those taxes in the price of the product we buy. So under the fair tax, what happens is prices will go down, there will be a tax on consumption at the point of sale, and ultimately we'll be able to eliminate all of these lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and all these politicians that attempt to manipulate the tax code in order to manipulate human behavior. That is the, the intent. Um, it also um, it, it enables uh, free markets to prevail, because instead of you know, us making decisions based on what is the tax benefit, we're making decisions on what's best for our own utility. Uh, and, and the other big thing here is if you think about uh, the tax code as a whole, the cost of compliance is 50% of what we pay in taxes. That means a lot of people hire accountants, businesses hire accountants. Uh, we, we invest tons of time in complying with the tax code. What the fair tax does, it eliminates the IRS. April 15th is just another beautiful spring day. And, and, and ultimately, uh, we're taxed at the point of consumption, which makes everything a lot easier and more smooth and eliminates all the compliance costs. So that's the plan I'm for. Um, and like I said, six out of the seven people who represent the state of Oklahoma are also for it. So um, I know he keeps saying this, it's a crazy idea, but it's not. If I may respond, <clears throat> I do think it's a crazy idea. Uh, you know who else supports it? Is Tom Cruise. Uh, this is what it is. This is what it is. It's a 30% federal sales tax on everything we buy. Everything we buy. That means that if you spend 50 bucks on a tank of gas now, it's going to be 65. That means if you spend $100 at the grocery store, it's going to be 130. That means if your mortgage is $1,000 a month, it's going to be 1300 a month. That's, that's what it is. Now, it also means that if you go to the doctor's office, your medical bills are going to go up 30%, whether that be from immunizations or whether that be from chemotherapy. 
about is for cutting Social Security and cutting Medicare and all these other things. The, the, the reality is, um, when you look at Social Security, I have a few ideas. Um, number one, uh, right now you're capped at, uh, at $109,000 a year. You pay payroll taxes up to that. Beyond that, you don't pay payroll taxes. I think that we need to look at eliminating that, that requirement. That, you know, you pay taxes, payroll taxes on all the income you make. Now, the other thing we have to look at is the retirement age, given that people are living longer. Now, these are plans that are very consistent with Dr. Coburn, who is a very conservative Republican in the U.S. Senate. And, 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 and ultimately, um, my opponent likes to say, I'm going to cut Social Security because it's part of the fear tactics that the Democrats are trained to, to tell everybody so that everybody thinks they're going to lose their, their, their retirement. The reality is, um, you know, if you're 50 years and older, nothing should change for you. If you're 50 years and younger, my generation, we need to look at how we fix the system for future generations because it needs to be solved. Um, but all these issues are, are big for our country. We need to elect responsible people that are willing to tackle them and not be demonized or unfairly treated that, you know, he wants to, you know, take away your Social Security. That's not what this is about. But at, at, at every department within our federal government, we have to take a serious look and say, how do we control the growth of this? Because it, it's an anchor around our neck. So you mentioned Social Security, so I'm going to just jump right into that, branching off from education. Uh, this is a kind of a new thing that you brought up because I've mentioned the payroll tax many times, and you never mentioned it once up until this point. But let's let's say what, let's 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 talk about let's talk about where this is coming from. So you mentioned 50 uh, or older now, and he's offering a rather cynical deal. This is what it is. You keep your benefits if you're 50 and older. If you sell out your kids and your grandkids, that's really what it is. We can keep Social Security and Medicare solvent into the next century with common sense approaches. Right? We don't have to live through retirement age. We don't have to do it. And there are many people in this country who can't keep working to a higher age. You're talking about construction workers, people that, that beat their bodies up for their entire working lives. They just can't continue to do those jobs. Uh, the, the scare tactic that he says that I'm using is basically a quote from his own position. And he said in a questionnaire to the League of Women Voters, you can keep Social Security if you're 55 and older, just 55. But if you're younger than that, look to a church, a charity, your family, or your savings before you ever drop in the social safety net. That's what he said. That's where I'm getting this from. Do you have that somewhere? Yeah. It's on the internet. We'll, we'll provide it to you if you need it. So, look, Social Security is a promise that we made to people in the Great Depression that we've kept for 80 years. And the promise was this. If you invest in this fund your entire life and the bottom falls out of your personal investments, that at the very least, you will have enough money to pay for a roof over your head and enough money to eat. That was the promise. That was the deal that we made. 
have a United States Congress that does not and cannot, for whatever reason, balance the budget. And so we have this $1.3 trillion annual deficit. And, and, and so how do we fund all of this deficit? Well, we have to sell bonds. We have to sell American Treasury Security. And so what QE3 does is, is they create new money out of thin air. They take that newly created money, they buy those newly created bonds, and voila, we can fund the government. They've done this before. It's, it's historical practice. It's, it's not illegal. It's, and I think it's a perfectly appropriate thing for the Fed to do. I am not one of these guys who says we need to end the Fed. In fact, I think that's the wrong answer. Um, but what I will say is this. We need to change Congress, which is why I ran in the first place. We need to get people that are willing to go to Washington, D.C. and make the difficult decisions, regardless of how popular they may be, and say, look, we cannot continue spending money in this fashion because it is destroying the U.S. dollar. When we create money out of thin air, which is what we're doing, what happens to the U.S. dollar is it, it loses value. It loses value against the basket of foreign currencies, and then we lose investment in the United States of America. <coughs> He's going to give you a quote about foreign direct investment being up 58%. That's a small fraction of, of overall investment when you include portfolio investment and everything else. Now, the, the reality is the solutions before us are, are, are number. Number one, we can let interest rates go up. That's one viable alternative, because right now people aren't buying American Treasury securities because we have so much debt and so much deficit. They're not buying them. So if we let interest rates go from 3% to 6%, we could fund the government. The problem is when we do that, federal spend, as a percentage of federal spending at 3% interest, we're at you know, over 10% uh, as a percentage of federal spending just on service of the national debt. So if interest rates went from 3% to 6%, now that doubles the percentage of federal spending on service of the national debt. In other words, we receive no benefit from the taxes we're paying. We're paying old debts. And, and so that's not a viable solution. When you do that, you crowd out private sector investment because everybody's buying treasury securities. You bust the United States budget. And, and ultimately, um, it's not a good solution to let interest rates go up. The other thing we could do is we could tax people more. Of course, that's not good for the economy either because then you misallocate scarce resources. You take it from the people who create wealth and create jobs and you turn it over to a government that wants to misallocate it according to their will. That's not a good solution either. The other solution is to continue printing money faster than we've ever printed before and use that newly printed money to buy those bonds and destroy the dollar and dry up capital formation in our country. That's not a good solution either. But this is not a solution that either one of us created, quite frankly. This is, this is created over time with these politicians that go to Washington, D.C., and they promise everything to everybody. And that time has to end. We have to elect people that are responsible, that are willing to balance the budget. Let me say this. You, you've heard Chairman Bernanke talk about the fiscal cliff. What the fiscal cliff is, what if, uh, if, what if we, we, uh, we, let it, we let taxes go up, which is going to happen January 1st, and at the same time we cut $600 billion from the Department of Defense? Well, I think now an estimated down to $500 billion from the Department of Defense because of 
cannot untax the drivers of capital formation, as, as you said. The, the drivers of capital formation in this country have been and always will be the middle class and small businesses. What his tax plan, what I'll call it the bright side tax, what his tax plan does is it adds a 30% federal sales tax on everything we buy, on everything a small business sells, on everything a middle class or poor person buys. That's a big, wet 30% blanket on the drivers of capital formation. That's all I've got. Yes, ma'am. I think that, all right, so I do think that we do need to have definitely a revaluation of our tax code. And I'll give you an example of some of the things. So I think a couple of things need to happen. One, we need to close a lot of loopholes that are in the tax code. Two, we need to start collecting the revenue that is already embedded in the tax code. Some people are going to have to pay more. So let's start out with an example of one of the loopholes that I would propose that we close. Investment bankers, as an example, might make a base salary of what is and then they get what's called uh, management compensation, and that might be in the range of $10 million a year. And that is labeled a capital gain. They didn't put any of their own capital at risk, not, not a dime, and yet it's called a capital gain, and they get taxed at a much, much lower interest rate, or a much, much lower percentage. That's a loophole that I would close, because we do need to get revenue into the, into the system. Um, small businesses, look, a lot of the a lot of the taxes, a lot of things are caused by um, regulatory problems in, in the country. I think that we need to streamline the regulatory process. I think we need to streamline the tax code. And look, I look at things from a military perspective. I'm an army guy, and I'll tell you this: only one percent of Americans ever served in the armed forces, and we have asked that one percent to pay our nation's debts in red. And I will insist that we ask the wealthiest 1% to pay their share in green. Uh, regarding the foreign direct investment uh, piece here, um, let, let's talk for a second about what foreign direct investment is, because this directly applies to what he said, that we have the greatest currency in the world. Um, foreign direct investment is when a company abroad decides that they don't have confidence in the U.S. dollar so they open a plant or they open equipment in the United States of America so they don't have to convert those dollars back to their home currency where, where it would you know, not translate into as much money. So, so yes, we have an increase in foreign direct investment. It's a direct reflection of the fact that, that we're destroying the U.S. dollar right now. And, and I know you said that the U.S. dollar is the, the envy of the world. Why is it that world um, economies right now are calling for a new world currency that's not the United States dollar. You've got China and India and Russia and Brazil. You've got countries around the world that have lost confidence in the U.S. dollar. We are in a great position right now, in spite of the fact that our country has all of these problems. We are in a great position because we have the world reserve currency. That's, an, that's a very important position for us to maintain. Now, to the extent that we continue to, to go down these roads where we're destroying the dollar, where, we're, where Congress cannot control spending, and because of that, we're destroying it. We're printing money to buy bonds to fund the government. Because of that, people don't have confidence in the U.S. dollar. And when you don't have confidence in the U.S. dollar, we do get more foreign direct investment because they want to keep their money here. They don't want to take it back to their home, home country. But, but, but ultimately, um, our dollar is not, is not in a good position. And, and, what we and to the extent that it is, uh, when you compare it against foreign currencies like the euro, it's because those currencies are even worse than ours. And, and this is the other thing. If we want to get manufacturing back into the United States of America, we have to have we have to be in a position of strength for negotiation. So what's been going on recently is, you know, China has advantages over us because they don't have all of the regulation and they've got uh, less expensive labor than here in the United States. So they have an advantage. They've got a, a manufacturing advantage built in. Now here's what should happen in a free market: as we buy their goods, the, their currency, the Chinese yuan should increase. It should increase in value, which means we should have more uh, development here in the United States as far as manufacturing and jobs. We should have more of that because their goods relative to our goods then become more expensive. But what happens is we're destroying our own currency in order to fund our government. And so
And so we can't point the finger at China and say, quit cheating, quit devaluing your currency. Every time their currency gets strong and manufacturing should come back to the United States, they devalue their currency. That's what happens. And we should be in a position of strength and say, hey, don't devalue your currency anymore. But we, we're not in that position because we're devaluing our own currency in order to finance the debt and the deficit of our government. I think you asked a question about uh, countries calling for different currencies. And I think I answered that the first time, which is they've done that throughout history in their own self-interest. And yet they still come blocking us to the top. Thank you, Gal. Well, you've heard a lot today. We've got just a few minutes. We're going to draw for our door prize, which is a $25 chamber bag. And Council, I don't want to draw for. I don't want to get someone to get mad.